Uh, thank you all for coming. My name is Alex Wilson. I'm chair of the leadership team of this. Thank you, Bethany, and thank you for thank you SIT for hosting this this afternoon. Uh, Laura Sebelia is, as many of you know, she's uh, elected to the legislature for uh, next term and is on her way down to Montpelier. So she's going to uh, come in a little bit later. Oh, she's here. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, great. I'd like to introduce Laura Sebelia from the <laughs> Credit Corporation. Uh, BDCC has really made this initiative possible. Uh, it was really their vision going back quite a few years, Jeff Lewis, who's here, the then executive director in the back. Uh, you know, a group of us were talking about the eco-economy uh, eight or nine years ago, and this is really the result of that, you know, long-term discussion. But Laura really put the pieces together, uh, tied into the closure of Vermont Yankee, and some economic development agency funding, she brought some uh, resources to the table to enable us to hire Vital Economy. Uh, you'll hear from Frank Knott a little bit later. Vital Economy is a consultant working for BDCC to sort of work us through this process of uh, creating the Ecovation Hub. But I'd like to introduce Laura and have her say a few words about uh, the bit of the history of this. Thanks. Alex, talk about split second timing. Uh, welcome everybody, and we appreciate all of you being here. Uh, my comments will be brief, uh, talking a little bit about what tonight is all about, really. This is the culmination of phase one of this project. And I want to take just a moment <clears throat> in between a few deep breaths because I was running in with Edie from Cheshire County from way back in the parking lot to try and make these comments. Um, to talk about what the, um, to talk about the folks that actually were instrumental in bringing this project. Um, I appreciate your kind words, Alex. Uh, but Alex, <coughs> Peter Yost from Dungeon Green, Nadav, uh, Guy Payne, Eli Gould, uh, a lot of meetings, Frank Knott, uh, there's Frank, uh, a lot of uh, thinking, talking, turning, Jeff, as we know. And as part of our SEDS process, this went on for a number of years. And it really required some commitment and belief and investment of time and energy. So I think we have had a great phase one. Uh, we're getting ready to launch into phase two. We have a number of engaged stakeholders that are ready to move forward um, with some terrific opportunities. Tonight, you will be hearing uh, really about the scale of this opportunity in the region. And we'll also be talking about the need to continue acting regionally. When we started, regionally meant Wyndham County meant 27 towns. Felt big. Now we're talking about three counties in three states. And so the challenges in continuing to grow that cohesion, I think we'll be experiencing in this next phase and, and working through and figuring out some innovative ways to keep moving together. So I thank you all for your participation and look forward to working with you on the next part. Thanks, Alex. Thanks, Laura, and congratulations on your re-election. Uh, we'll have an advocate in Montpelier as we move ahead with this initiative. So uh, on the screen here is uh, showing our meeting objectives for today. We want to uh, give a we want to review what we've done to date, sort of some of our accomplishments. Describe what we want to create with uh, the Ecovation Hub organization in the longer term, and talk about some of the implementation steps to get there. Uh, we want to uh, show you some of the key stakeholders and how they will engage with the Ecovation Hub moving forward, and uh, expand the regional participation. You know, we've we've done an incredible job, I feel, in bringing in a lot of participation from our three-state area. Uh, it's been really exciting to see people and businesses come out of the woodwork that I had no idea existed. And some of the ideas that have been created have been really, uh, really wonderful. But also, today, we want to really celebrate where we are. So I encourage you all to stick around. We're going to have some social time after the conclusion of the formal meeting. 
We've got some wine and uh, refreshments that uh, you can all enjoy, uh, thanks to SIT World Learning. Um, so, next slide. Maybe if you could advance that. Uh, okay, so next I want to introduce Candace Pearson to give a bit of an overview of some of the exciting projects we've been cataloging and, and uh, fostering the, the creation of over the last uh, really seven or eight months. Candace works for Building Green, a company I founded back in, 19, in uh, 1985. Uh, we publish environmental building news and other publications related to green building. Uh, we're a consulting firm as well. Candace came to us, what, four or five years ago out of college as an intern initially. We convinced her to stay on when her one year internship ended and she's done an amazing job not only with our company but she's launched and co-directs a, a local regional group, uh, the Southern Vermont Young Professionals Group and it's, that's done an awesome job in getting younger people, millennials, excited about the region and excited about the businesses that exist here. So Candace, let me turn this over to you. Thank you. So I'm going to give this uh, advancer one more try. Yep. Okay, great. So this uh, meeting is going to be a little different than some of our other milestone meetings and that's because we have so many projects. Um, if any of you were at Milestone 3, you probably heard a little bit of in-depth presentation about each of those projects. Um, but we felt like there's been so much work that we really wanted to show you all the breadth of kind of business opportunities that have come up in this work. And there are a lot of ideas, um, and there are a lot of value in those ideas. So we wanted to give you a little taste of each of those. Um, so I'm actually going to go through all of those business uh, opportunities that people have been working on in kind of a lightning round format. Some of the people who have been project leading those ideas are here. So when I go into your project opportunity, um, if, you're, if the project leader is here, please stand up so everyone can see your face. And um, if people are interested afterwards, hopefully you can connect with that person. So these business opportunities, are we have categorized them into three different groups. One is uh, projects with champions. So these are projects that have originated in the hub. They came, they came up through our process. And someone has said, I'm going to take this on and advance it forward. And we've been working on that process for a while now. And most of these are really close to implementation. They've demonstrated a business case. We have someone leading it. And um, we're confident that that can move forward. Then there are projects that are self-advancing. These projects also have champions, but they, we can't take really credit for them because they, were, you know, they originated in a different organization. Um, and people have been promoting them outside of the process of the hub. So we love those projects and we'd really like to keep involved with those projects and help them in any way we can, but we can't personally take any credit for them. And then there's this third category, which is business opportunities without champions yet. So there are a lot of ideas that have come up through this process. Um, some of them are really great ideas that have a lot of potential to bring in business and bring in jobs. And we really need an entrepreneur who can say, I want to take this on. Um, and I want to advance it forward. So if any of these opportunities you're interested in tonight, we'd love to talk to you, um, and hopefully we'll spread it around to your network and see if other people are interested in them as well. So first I'm gonna start with that first group, the Projects with Champions. And this is the, just the full uh, spread of what that looks like. And our first group is the Lean Energy Retrofit Group. So, um, Let's see, the Lean Retrofit Group, this, the leader of this was uh, Taryn Fisher. And the Lean Retrofit Group looked at many barriers that, <laughs> thank you, Taryn, <laughs> great. Um, the Lean Retrofit Group looked at the many barriers that people undergoing a retrofit face. Um, so you might want to start a retrofit project in your own home, but you don't know where to start, you don't know which um, programs might give you financial incentives. There's so many steps to go through, and there's no one there to kind of lead you through the entire process. Um, so Terry really, really found this need that um, there really needs to be a person that connects all of these different aspects of a deep energy retrofit, and came up with the idea of a connector or a certified energy coach. Um, and so we feel like this idea can really open the way to have to more deep energy retrofits. 
and can build that market a little bit. And currently, this group is kind of wait is kind of on hold um, until some of the other projects are advancing because one project in particular promises to bring um, to do a 500 house energy retrofit um, in the region. And if that comes to fruition through the Ecofire group, then this uh, this group could potentially connect their energy co coach idea through that pilot project. So really exciting there, and there's a lot of interconnections between other groups. So the second idea is a resilient design advisor, and we've got Michael Knapp and Sierra Dickey as the leaders of that. Do you guys stand up for a second? Thank you, thank you. Um, and uh, Building Green is also working on that a little bit um, and have been in some of those meetings. This project is envisioned as a software program that will help people evaluate the risk that a property may face in a natural disaster. Um, and then the software will automatically generate recommendations to make that um, property more resilient. So um, we've talked about this software scaling up to a campus or community. Uh, uh, let's see, I think I got it. Yeah, we, so the, this is kind of a brief image of what the recommendations would look like if you went through the software program. It could scale up to a campus or community. And what's really excited, exciting about this is that um, some of our other players in the hub also have, um, also have expertise in resilience. And they've identified this as a real need. Um, so let's see, Abigail Agros Walton works at the Center for Climate Preparedness. Um, and in a recent webcast that that center put on, this was identified as something that could really be used in the industry. So we feel like the demand is there. Um, we have an idea and we have the expertise to implement some of these recommendations. And it's just about creating what's the business model? How is this going to be profitable? Another area is the foreign trade zone. And the foreign trade zone is actually a federally designated area um, where people can bring in goods pre-tax and you can add value or manufacture it as you wish. And then once it enters the consumer stream, then only then is it taxed. This could be a real benefit if we're bringing in things from Europe or other places where we might um, really need those materials. Let's say we add value in our region and then export it to the consumer market. This could be a structure that could be really great for that. Um, this is a little bit in the works right now because the federal guidelines have changed. So we're still kind of working out what exactly the change has been there and what are the um, new like designation, where are the lines are on now. So we're still keeping tabs on that, and it could be very beneficial if some of the other business opportunities identified um, come to fruition. cross laminated timber is another work group that's been very strong. Andrew Dye is here, and Bryce Hereford. Great, thank you, Bryce. Um, and cross laminated timber has been really interesting um, because this is uh, there's a lot of excitement about cross laminated timber in the industry. Um, it's an exciting new wood product that allows that you can replace concrete and steel. Um, so for the first time, we can build really, really tall buildings out of wood, um, which is really new. The initiative has been engaging with a lot of local companies to see if adding this product would help expand their operations. Um, so it, this is one product that has a lot of potential to grow existing jobs. Um, and in absence of that, we've also discovered that several players in our region actually have um, uh, actually have connections with manufacturers that currently do CLT in Europe or Canada. So it's possible that we might be able to attract those manufacturers here if we'd like to produce it ourselves. Um, and at the very least, we realized that the region has a very strong um, history and background in timber framing, um, especially with Benson Wood as a regional asset. Um, and if, you know, if we don't locate a manufacturer here, it's possible that we could be building on that expertise so that these timber framers could potentially be consultants with cross laminated timber becoming an increasing trend. Um, so we're currently working with the Vermont Sustainable Jobs Fund and Working Lands Enterprise Initiative, who are also really excited about wood products in the state. Um, and we're trying to collaborate there because so we're not duplicating efforts. But this is something that we're super excited about um, and it seems like it has support um, even at our statewide level. So I think the next opportunity is wool insulation. Wool insulation is um, it's an interesting product because it's uh, instead of let's say spray foam insulation or fiberglass insulation, uh, wool insulation is naturally flame retardant so you don't have to be adding chemicals. It's a better insulator when wet than some other materials are um, and it also brings acoustic benefits. So the interesting thing about this is that UVM, the UVM extension was recently awarded a USDA value added producer grant 
um, to explore this potential. Um, and we have the Green Mountain Spinnery located in Putney, a little over by Dummerston. Um, and so if we can connect those two assets, we think this could be a great business opportunity. Green Rural Development, Keith Dewey. Yeah, thank you. Um, green Rural Development is a, the idea that we have a lot of rural land to work with and we really want to be developing in an environmentally conscious way. So Keith has uh, envisioned this kind of development where there might be shared agriculture, transportation, recreational facilities, all within, um, all within one kind of condensed uh, development. Uh, it would also, he also envisions it as being ADA compliant and, being, and having very ultra efficient homes. So this is the kind of thing where we could use our expertise in the region and show what a kind of completely new residential development could look like and envision something that would be um, in accordance with our values. We envision something like this, not only just bringing great new homes to the area, but also something that could attract tourists who want to come see a completely new way of um, developing and living. So um, I, I threw in a picture here of what I consider cluster development, where you um, put some, uh, you put homes closer together so that you're preserving farmland and preserving rural development. Um, but Keith has some great ideas too about how this can be done. So the Knowledge Center, yeah, Education and Training Consortia, um, is, is one of the projects that's really far along and fairly developed. Um, and they have several different areas of kind of rollout. Abigail is standing up, she was the lead for that, uh, not that area. So the Education and Training Consortium is uh, positioned to be the first rollout. That is, um, this, there's a soft launch plan for July 1st. And the idea behind that is that several different educational institutions in the area are collaborating together to offer combined curriculum in the green economy space. So currently, SIT and Antioch already have put in place an agreement to work together to provide this to their students. So that's, that's already, it's already in place, it's already rolling out. Um, the, second, the second plan is to focus on the expansion of the Center for Climate Preparedness and Community Resilience. This is a great organization, it's hosted at Antioch currently. An expansion of that organization would really represent more jobs and more um, expertise in the area. So that's scheduled for spring 2018. Um, and then the a third level would be the Living Laboratory. The Living Laboratory is also tourism-based, bringing people to the region, showing them what kind of assets we have, and teaching them about how they can bring this back to their own communities. Uh, that would be also scheduled for summer 2018. And this is one area that we're really looking for someone with tourism background to come in and really take on this as a project. Um, and it's hosted under the Knowledge Center because, again, it's not focused on, on just college students, but focused on professionals and, and um, professional development. So, and then applied research and consulting, that's sort of the system integration and applied research lab, um, that, that would be the final stage. And the, the way that that's envisioned is bringing in um, high dollar consulting into ed our educational uh, institutions that already have a very strong knowledge base. So that whole thing kind of operate, this whole uh, idea operates as a system. It's an integrated, different way of doing things, but we do have phases that um, are planned out. something called the Living Building Challenge uh, in the green building space, which is, it's very aspirational. It includes net zero water, net zero energy, and the Living Community Challenge takes that same framework and applies it at a community scale. No projects um, in the nation are currently certified under this certification system yet. Um, some, some people have registered and said they're, they're going to try to do it. But the first one that does is really going to attract a lot of attention um, and a lot of national press. And we think that um, our area in particular could really, uh, could really be that place. Um, so we've been talking to several communities and several developments to see if this would be a good fit for them. Um, and included in that, we've talked to Elders Village, we've talked to Retreat Farm, which is going to come up a little bit later, um, and we've talked to Brattleboro and um, potentially Vernon. So we've got, a lot of, uh, we've got a lot of interest in this, and it would be a very good project, but something that would definitely kind of push us to the national scale. 
The regenerative agriculture and agroforestry projects, this was a latecomer group to this initiative, but it's been so key in how this initiative has developed. And there are tons of projects under this umbrella. Todd Montgomery has been leading this. Do we have Todd in the room today? I think he said he might not be able to make it. Okay. Well, Todd Montgomery has been leading it and has been really instrumental in bringing a lot of new people into the initiative. So some of those projects include medicinal herbs. Um, let's see, we have uh, Gino Palmer. Not yet. Um, Gino is, is, is focusing on bringing medicinal herbs um, <coughs> and growing medicinal herbs in, um, within for, forested environments. This is a picture of golden seal. And that little tiny acre there represents, could be $4,500, um, I'm sorry, $45,000 or $105,000 per acre potential. It's a really high value crop um, and used as a medicinal herb. People, it's in high demand. We have a local company called New Chapter that does uh, supplemental uh, supplement that distributes supplements. And if we could connect growers and a national distributor like that, that'd be um, a big, big move for the area. Another agriculture project is hazelnuts and chestnuts. Um, so we have David. Is David in the room? No. Um, David's focusing on hazelnuts because it has the potential to replace soy, um, and it is a good fit for our region. So this could be another high value crop. We're also looking at agriculture. Oh, sorry, Can we go back on. No? Okay, mushrooms. Um, Tad's also focusing on mushrooms because it also it also grows naturally in uh, the New England forests, and it's a really high value crop. You can kind of just picture it being, you know, uh, sh shipped into Boston to high dollar restaurants, um, and so that's one way that we could make use of our forested lands. Um, the next one is hazelnuts, which I thought was no. Okay, and that's one of agriculture and solar arrays. Tatiana is looking at doing compatible uses with solar fields and agriculture. So what can be grown underneath solar arrays? What, uh, what kind of grazing animals could be used there for that land? And then agritourism. Um, we have lots of natural uh, recreation spots. We have lots of working farms. How can we be adding more value to those farms by bringing people in with, with tourism opportunities? Um, and then agroforestry services. Uh, Tad is also leading this work group and he's applied for a working lands grant to teach an agroforestry class at Marlboro College. Um, so that's moving ahead and he also envisions um, transferring this into a, a consulting uh, service where he might go around to different farms um, and, and talk to them about how they might make better use of their uh, forests and how they can add more high value crops. Um, so currently, the, I think he's also in um, conversations with Antioch, I believe, talking about how there, that might, there might be some costs over there. And then hemp and building materials. Um, Emily is here. Yeah, hey, Emily. Um, so hempcrete uses limestone and not concrete, and so therefore it's a little bit, uh, it's, it's a better, got a better carbon profile than concrete does. Uh, hemp is, would be great for people with chemical sensitivity because it doesn't have as many um, toxic chemicals added into that building material. And Emily runs the company Help Hempfully Green. Um, you can see right here, there's the, mo the modular house that was built in Alberta. They're really looking to scale up that production. Um, and Emily just told me today that they recently got a $2,000 um, donation um, for fundraising. To help build up that, to help build up the, that production, and I think they're looking for um, a kitchen, industrial kitchen, to help um, expand this small uh, hempcrete, tiny home production. And then EcoFire. Uh, EcoFire is kind of the uh, driving force behind a lot of these initiatives. And Dan Yates and Kevin, can you stand up for a second? Dan Yates, Kevin, great, awesome. And Kevin, I'm going to have you come up in just a second. Um, because this is this is kind of a complicated one for me to talk about, but um, let's see. So EcoFire uh, is kind of based on a merchant bank model. So let me kind of show you the big picture here. Um, and then it's based on a merchant bank model because what we're trying to do with this is to house multiple services. So this entity would include lending, include investment, and include insurance as well as um, do its own green building metrics and, um, and analysis. So when you currently go to a bank, you might ask for a loan, but then they might not have the, the metrics to be able to uh, qualify that loan. And then you'd have to go to a separate entity to do the insurance. This, this um, framework 
combines all of that in one package so that you're not going around to different places and there aren't so many disconnects. Um, this is envisioned to help home them at the homeowner level if you're trying to do a, a retrofit, but it also um, could help at a kind of big, more aggregate levels. So if someone is looking to um, do something like the Brooks House and needs mezzanine funding, this kind of structure could help with that. It could also um, help with uh, businesses like those th thinking about in the Ecovation Hub who need impact investors. This draws that impact investment money into the, the entire framework. So the, the idea behind this is that we would start regionally. When I talked about that 500 um, retrofit pilot project, that's where this uh, initiative comes in. Start regionally with Ecofire and gradually expand um, regionally and eventually nationally. So we, we're thinking that a lot of the projects mentioned here would actually follow the trajectory of Ecofire's growth path. Um, and that's really important because, because Ecofire is the, um, the financial instrument that enables all of this, it's going to be opening new markets as it grows. And that will allow some of these other business opportunities to follow through on that growth path. So I, I've learned that there's been some recent developments, and I want Kevin to fill you in on what exactly the implementation looks like um, from now on, because this is really key to where the other, the other projects will land. Thank you, Candace. So I'm going to stand up. I'm going to stand here because I'm only going to be here for a few minutes. Um, so we've got a lot of questions since uh, Moscow 3, uh, which is only a month ago, about why would anybody want to invest in this? Why are there people out there that have the money, impact investors or funds or banks or crowdsourcing? Why would anybody want to put their money into an Ecofire platform to invest? in some of the projects and the companies and the businesses that we've just seen. So we've developed this slide to try to encapsulate that for you today. This is the investment pipeline that Ecofire is envisioning. And it's pretty simple until you start looking at the details. Um, but simply stated, it is, it's, it's designed to aggregate both the impact capital, which is kind of down here, you know, funding that might be out there available from unusual sources through a CDFI or a community development financial institution. For example, the Federal Home Loan Bank. Federal Home Loan Bank is a consortium of member banks, of which Brattleboro is a member, that actually puts out funding for very innovative green home and green economic development projects around the country. Well, most people don't know that exists if you're outside of the banking world but it does exist. So if we have a place for that money to go here in the region through Ecofire, we could actually tap into a considerable amount of money. And that's just one example in this lower box of kind of impact capital folks. And then above we have sort of traditional equity investors. Um, you know, you've probably heard this before in companies, they're Series A, they're founders, they're venture capitalists out there who want to get a return on their investment, but they also want to do good things and they care about this location. And we've already started to engage with some of those investors in the region. There's a lot of interest. But they have to invest into an entity that can actually pay them back. Uh, they can't invest into a nonprofit. A nonprofit can't pay them back. So they've got to invest into this entity of this corporation called Ecofire, of which they are a shareholder. And that shareholder gets dividends from the company. So these two green boxes co-invest into what we call the credit stack or the capital stack of equity funds and loan funds that get put together by this merchant banking entity into various different products that invest in companies and clean energy assets and real estate, green real estate, equipment leasing. Um, you know, say you're a, a manufacturer and you want to upgrade your uh, your heating system or your production system to become combined heat and power, but you don't have the capital to do that. Ecofire could provide a capital source or a package of capital sources to do that for you. It could invest in green bonds for community upgrades, like community-wide upgrades, so community solar or street lighting or, or water efficiency in an entire community. It could invest in IP or data systems. We've talked a lot about the information that will come out of these investments. 
So you've got to develop all of those, those infrastructures and, and the marketing, the development of that. So EcoFire could invest in that. But ultimately what it's designed to do is create repayment streams because when you green your buildings, when you green your communities, when you invest in a more efficient infrastructure through renewable energy or, or uh, you know, more efficient water systems, more efficient food systems, you actually create value. And EcoFire is designed to lend or invest money into entities that create that additional value, that incremental value through efficiency, which then creates a repayment stream that goes back into the company. And just like every investment company or fund, some of that money gets distributed to its investors as a return, and some of that money goes back into the very products that are being invested in. And so it is a virtuous cycle. The reason why it's set up this way, as opposed to you know, sort of a traditional government-sponsored entity uh, or a nonprofit entity, is this is designed to do one thing and one thing only. It's designed to channel capital into the blue boxes. That's all it does. It thinks about every single day. There are people in EcoFire that do this for a living. They wake up every day and they look at the, the marketplace here in the region and say, what deals can I do today? What businesses can I help grow or launch today? And that's why it's really important to get it into an entity that is focused on its mission and focused on its region. So I hope this is helpful in explaining exactly what we're thinking about when we talk about this investment platform. Great, thanks. Um, that definitely better explain than I could have done. <laughs> okay, great. Um, and then we've got to finish up here with, um, so that, yeah, that, that finishes up the projects with champions list. And then, so I wanted to keep going with the projects that um, are self-advancing. So these are projects that still have champions, but that are kind of rolling on their own, and we would like to kind of keep the, keep the communications lines open to see if we can support them in any way that we can. The first one of those is Rich Earth Institute. Rich Earth Institute is, uh, just got a huge grant from the National Science Foundation. They're doing great testing work. Um, and they've got a couple of business ideas that have a lot of potential. One of them is to work with um, the port Best Septic, which is a port potty business, um, and convert some of those to urine diverting port potties um, or composting port potties so that you're not using that uh, blue sludge, right? Um, and then the other business idea is urine diverting composting toilets like you might see at community gardens or that people might want on their farms. So being able to package those, distribute those, and turn that into a business is a real opportunity. Um, Rich Earth, like I said, is very organized, is moving along, and we'd like to try to continue to help them if we, if we can bring some more attention to what they're doing. Biomass energy systems, there's been a lot of interest in this in the Ecovation Hub. But it turns out there's a lot of people working on it as well. So Wynnum Woodheat currently is working on that in the Wynnum region. Um, and people are looking at things like uh, semi-dried wood pellets or wood, um, wood chips. I'm sorry, semi-dried wood chips or wood pellets. Um, and we're also, we also talked about maybe importing, importing boilers. Currently, no one really has um, taken that on, but we would like to continue to work with the players who are, who are doing that. Um, the Center for Climate Preparedness, I've already mentioned, um, Abigail is, is leading that expansion and that organization is, is moving along. Um, so we'd like to continue, especially with the applications of the Educational Consortium, we'd like to continue to keep an eye on that. And the Retreat Farm. The Retreat Farm is uh, done by the Kraft and Cheese, if you all have ever been there. They have a really interesting project going on where they're seeking to become a regional center for agriculture, historic education, community events and recreation. So they have envisioned this entire master plan that's centered around bringing people to that farm and doing lots of educational events. Um, they'd like to be competitive with Shelburne Farm up in uh, Burlington, if people are familiar. Um, and they could potentially host a conference center, which would be really useful for, um, for our efforts, bringing in people to do professional education. Um, so yeah, so we're definitely keeping an eye on that. And if, we, and if there's ways to work with them moving forward, we'll try to do that. Uh, food Connects is another shining star in the region. Um, I knew of Food Connects for a long time because of the Vermont Farm to Plate uh, initiative and the Vermont Farm to School. Uh, but they actually do food, 
food distribution as well. So it's really hard as a small farmer to get your food products out into the world. And Food Connects bridges that gap by taking refrigerated trucks around to multiple farms, collecting that food and tying them into distribution networks. Um, so Food Connects sources from growers primarily in Wyndham County um, and Cheshire County currently. They also do a little bit of work in Franklin County, but they're looking to expand. So they source from over 30 producers, um, and they connect those to 50 wholesale buyers currently. Um, and they could expand pretty drastically with some added, uh, some added investment. They um, are currently planning to ramp up to double gross sales in 2017. So they're on a trajectory for growth, and we think they fit pretty well into our agroforestry and, um, agroforestry and agriculture initiatives. So, and these are the projects without Champions lists, and I'm just going to briefly point these out. I don't have um, company slides to them because they're just ideas at this point. And we'd like people to, uh, you know, if they're interested in anyone, kind of take them on and run with them. Um, we're just going to point out a few. The Green Bridge program has been a really interesting one that was kind of the brainchild of Stephen Dotson, if he's here. Um, yeah, he's in the back. Um, <laughs> I really love this idea because there's so many students who come to school in this region they come to SIT, they, they come to Marlboro, but then they leave. Um, and the Green Bridge program is kind of envisioned as a way to, okay, you've graduated from school, let's connect you with an employer, and you have a job right out of school. Stay in the region, um, work at that job for a year or two, and it will act as your bridge into the employ employment world. Um, this could also alternatively be something that would attract graduating students to our region um, as the Green, green Bridge year, right? So instead of like a gap year, I think of it as kind of a Green Bridge year. Um, so that's one idea. Um, we also have a strong basis in HVAC systems regionally, um, but ne haven't necessarily been, have gotten traction on someone who wants to advance those technologies in terms of uh, high performance uh, mechanical systems for buildings. Wood fiber insulation has also been an idea that we've kind of played around with. Um, it, this is something that, again, could be an alternative to spray foam insulation or fiberglass. And um, wood fiber insulation could make use of our low-grade low wood supply. So if, if we can gain, gain traction on that, that would be a good one. Um, vacuum insulated doors. Apparently, this is a weak point in our building envelopes. Um, so you might build a great wall, but all of your energy is going out through your door. Um, vacuum insulated doors are kind of like your thermos, right? You suck out all the air and suddenly have a great high performing door. Uh, they're currently very expensive and there's not a lot of producers around. So this might be a, kind of a niche product that would be gaining pretty uh, big traction uh, nationally in the high performance market. Let's see, some other of these examples are wild, wildlife habitat enhancement. So uh, a lot of people are interested in creating habitats for birds, right? You see bird houses everywhere. Um, but that can be that can extend to so much more. Um, and <coughs> certain products could be habitats for you know, native species that are, are endangered or things like that. So creating little tiny or you know small consumer things that might be sold to landowners to help create habitats for those animals and wildlife could be a, a really great business opportunity. And then small farm tool and equipment sales. A lot of the farm equipment these days are the big honking tractors when a lot of small farms are these family owned businesses who can only afford a certain amount in their equipment. So um, things like, from the developing nations, for example, that people are still using um, small, small, small tractors or small, um, small hand driven um, equipment could, be, could actually have a pretty big market here if we could reintroduce them. Um, so if anyone's interested in these, feel free to come and talk to me afterwards or if something up here is kind of intriguing and I didn't go over it, feel free to talk to me about it. Um, but I think I'm running out of my time. So I'm going to hand this over back to Alex to talk about where we're going with this initiative. These are great ideas, but we need some structure to move them forward in the next phase. So we've come up with a governance structure um, and we'd like to share that with you next. Thanks, Candace. Uh, it's great to see that sort of lightning speed uh, review of all the, or not all, but many of the ideas that have been talked about over these last months. And it really has been exciting to see so many ideas from this small part of the country that are, uh, you know, potential business ideas and many, in many cases existing business ideas that we can grow. So I'm going to next introduce Frank Knott, who I mentioned earlier. Frank has been kind of the brains behind a lot of this. 
He has a company in Baltimore, Maryland, uh, Vital Economy, that has gone around the country working with communities to identify clusters of assets and work with the communities to turn those assets into economic growth. And he does this in rural areas. There's a lot of focus in urban areas. You know, cities uh, have a lot more resources available to them. Frank and his company has specialized in, in rural areas. And he's done work for Brotherboro Development Credit Corporation for, what, six or seven years. Uh, and he's been the key consultant on this project and really helped us figure out uh, how to go about all this. So Frank, and I should mention Frank's partner, Jim Haywood, uh, who's actually based in Port Angeles, Washington, has participated in many of these meetings and discussions, uh, a colleague of Frank's with Vital Economy. Thank you, Alex. I'm going to try to not bore you with uh, governance. Uh, I'm going to try to make this exciting. Uh, to frame some of what we've been talking about here, the projects that you've seen just in the Knowledge Center through 2022 have the potential, uh, based on the business plan development, to create 70 to $100 million of annual revenue and hundreds of new jobs across this region. EgoFire alone, uh, within six years, uh, will do at least $160 million worth of financing uh, and have grown to a national footprint and will have at least 250 to 300 jobs in the EgoFire platform based here in this region. This will be one of the most innovative finance companies in the country, uh, in the green economy. It's intended to make this region to cause this region to be known as the place to come for the kind of financing and the kind of creative um, products and services and education that you want. And this is why Equifire is so central to enabling all these other uh, efforts to take place. Now, how are we going to get organized to do that? And we basically have the two platforms that we have to focus on. Uh, one is a strategic framework and one is an operational model. And um, it starts with the vision. Many of you have seen the vision. Uh, our goal here is to become a, rec the rec a or the recognized national leader in creating resilient, sustainable buildings and communities with a particular focus on what we call community-scale counties versus district-scale counties. 50% of the population of the U.S. lives in 146 counties of this country. All the remaining counties, which are roughly about 2,950 or so, have populations of 50,000 or less. That's our target market for this reason. That's the experience you all have. That's the expertise you can bring. It's a huge market, much like our business at Vital Economy. Not a lot of people like to go to rural America and do this kind of work. Lots of people love to go to urban America and do it. Uh, so there's a real need out there in the, in the marketplace. In order to do that, we've intentionally created five strategic platforms. And you see the star that links them all in the middle. The idea here is that, for instance, FIRE, which is what now is going to be called EcoFIRE, which is where the finance and insurance products are, this basically is being designed to address all the barriers in finance in these community-scale communities and create an integrated solution that then opens up the market, for instance, in the Knowledge Center, for us to offer a finance product that has insurance that assures that the energy efficiency that you invested to get, you actually will get, or you get paid by an insurance product, requires that we have certified technicians, certified professionals and planners. Where is that going to come from? The knowledge center. Okay? So there's an integration there. At the same time, we also have research products and services. So that as we're developing a lot of the products, CLT and all these that we came out with that are going to have in the marketplace, where is the financing going to come from? Ecofire. Where are the trained people going to come from to put those in place? 
knowledge set. So there's a full integration there. And then as we develop the capability at community scale in the U.S., we then have the opportunity to take, working with SIT and other organizations in this region, to transfer that community scale capability to the international market. Okay? And finally, up here at the top, was, uh, and due to Tad Montgomery, bringing to bear regenerative agriculture and agroforestry, we have the opportunity to now create, teach communities how to live with their land and, 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 and live uh, sustainably and also create sustainable uh, produce, sustainable products that come out of that land in order to feed into the research products and services that can be, that can be financed. So there's a purpose for having five platforms and having a hub that organizes those platforms. That's why the hub's in the middle. If you want to know why the hub is here, it's to keep everything integrated and working with each other. And we actually saw the magic of that uh, yesterday morning over at Antioch with a meeting over the key leaders of the leadership team, Michael Knapp from Green River Software, and uh, Dan, um, there you are, and Dan Yates from Brattleboro Savings were over there, talking about the linkage of knowledge center, finance, and, and data. And I think we came, they came out with about six major opportunities already that they started working on as a result of that connection. So the, in, that's the strategic platform. The operational model says, okay, how these are intended to be geared, showing how things work together. So how do we actually organize to make those platforms stay in place and actually make it work? There are four key elements. The yellow is the leadership team. And I'll describe that in a little bit, that, that, that we've reconstituted what that should look like going forward for implementation. Second piece is the green, which is fiduciary. There has to, currently, Ecovation Hub is not a corporation, is not a nonprofit, is not a for-profit. It's an initiative. It has to move to an organizational model. But as we do that, we have to have a fiduciary that provides two things. One is what I call back office services. Instead of us going out and hiring administrative people and all that, we buy that service from an existing fiduciary that can provide all those core services they're already doing for other things. You know, VDCC is a perfect kind of organization to help do that. We also need a depository, a 501c3 depository for the kinds of hundreds of thousands of dollars and millions of dollars that we would be attracting and developing into this topic. So we have, so we've got to have those two fiduciary functions. Third, we have, we have basically, we've moved from a four county description to a three region description. The Manatomac region of New Hampshire, the upper valley of uh, Massachusetts, and southern Vermont. So it's a more expansive look at who's connected to this. We need to have local liaisons based at the board level and local liaisons at the operational level that are working with the staff of, so that they're actually people in each of the three regions pulling these assets out, connecting these assets into the whole. And then fourth, we have implementation partners. So the example would be the Knowledge Center is now spinning off an education and training consortium that will be its own enterprise with a combination of six, seven, or eight institutions. That's an, in the, that's an actual implementation partner. We still have Knowledge Center developing, people working in Knowledge Center developing other aspects that are going to flow from that, okay? So that's, does that make sense? We have four implementation elements, gears, and we, that, keep, that move that five platform strategy forward. Does that make sense? Okay. So, I'm not going to cut, you can get copies of these. There's an actual description of who, what the primary leadership role is of the leadership team. And I'll describe later what that, um, what the leadership team will look like. One of the things I want to make sure you understand is that the leadership team's role is to be the champion of this initiative across the entire region. It is to be the organization that works with all the existing economic development entities, the, the regional planning organizations, the state organizations in each area, the chambers that are already existing to make sure we're leveraging their resources and, and, and not duplicating their services. Okay, we're actually complementing that. Secondly, 
The role of leadership team is to be the primary responsible party for organizing the fund development and the cash flow for this entire uh, operation going forward uh, and hire staff. The, the way it will be organized, you have the leadership team, we have these five action team areas, knowledge center, fire, products and service, and they have work groups under them. Okay, and they will ultimately spin off implementation partners. So you've got the action teams and the work groups are the key primary pieces of this. The fiduciary I've already talked about, these are the functions of what we need in a fiduciary uh, so that we can manage and have the basic back office operations and manage the functions. Implementation partners uh, for each of the five areas will ultimately spin off implementation partners. EcoFire is an implementation partner. It will be ultimately connected back to the hub. It just doesn't, what we had before Ecovation Hub or the Green Economy Initiative that we started this was a bunch of individual assets and a bunch of individual towns and a bunch of individual counties, most of which weren't connected to each other, didn't know who each other were. We now have a hub that's organizing all these so they can leverage each other, other's assets. And the people were coming in today, they were, they were really commenting to me from New Hampshire, Massachusetts, and Vermont how incredible this hub has been for opening up their eyes to opportunities they can now connect to and business opportunities that they're realizing they can take advantage of. The, the local liaisons at the staff level will be people that will be funded in the regions to act as the champions on the ground in addition to leadership that's from the regions that's sitting on the leadership team. So this is how it gets organized together. You have the leadership team, the implementation partners will see a dotted lines back to the hub, uh, but they're not hard line because they're not being managed by the hub. You have the fiduciary out there, which they, you know, we're buying that service, and you'll see blue local liaisons are actually the on-the-ground staff at the local area connecting into the executive administrative team. And then you have the action team below that. So that's how we intend to organize this. The leadership team itself, and this has just been approved in the last two weeks, will have 13 people on the leadership team. There will be one person for each of the five strategic platforms. So the strategic platforms are represented at the leadership level. There will be three representatives for each of the three economic regions, one represented for each of the three economic regions. The Monadnock region, the upper Pioneer Valley, and Southern Vermont. There will be three additional at-large members, and those at-large members are to be people who have significant expertise that goes well beyond the region and connects us into the national markets and international markets. There would be two elected officers that are independent of the members above. And you total all that up, it's 13. Okay? And we're saying that they're gonna have anybody, there are, uh, you serve for a period of two years, um, officers can only serve two consecutive terms, uh, and after one absence, you can be elected back to the board. So that's the structure right now. Uh, the organization is intended to be um, an a enterprise that is cooperative in nature and a membership-based entity. We're still working through the details of that, what that actually looks like as a legal structure. But think of it, how many of you are familiar with Ocean Spray as a cooperative? Okay, that has farmer members. Just imagine the hub as a, this is a group of members from the five, that have interest in the five different platforms in the three different regions, who want to belong to this hub as members and are paying members because they get, they get benefits out of being in that hub. They're, they're building business relationships through that hub and getting access to markets and getting access to a common brand that can take them national. The, uh, the other thing I want to make sure we, uh, one of the other roles here is to connect the Ecovation Hub to all of these other kinds of organizations. Okay? There's a lot of work in resilience planning and sustainability. For instance, let's say that the regional planning commissions really want to go, they have a huge problem um, with some poor uh, community infrastructure that they'd like to see upgraded. Ecofire could be a partner with regional planning commissions to help bring the capital in to actually do it, not just rely on government grants. Uh, you could do the same thing with workforce development. 
through the knowledge center, the connections there to develop different ways we work for development. So these are, Egovation Hub does not replace any of these functions. It complements and actually enriches the ability of those organizations to function. Now, it all gets down to money. Okay, how, how, how is this going to function? How are we going to do this? Um, the, we have basic core operations for the hub, and then you have the funding and financing for EcoFire, for Knowledge Center, and for these new innovations that are going to need uh, venture funding and things of that nature. The, the core funding, the largest funding operation in this whole offer, effort is going to be EcoFire. That, that we're going to be raising millions of dollars of capital every year uh, to, to move the kind of financing products through here that your organizations can take advantage of. Um, so EcoFire will be, uh, and, and Alex will talk about this a little later, how EcoFire will collaborate with the Ecovation Hub uh, in trying to make sure we have coordinated funding and financing. Um, we see six different sources of revenue for the Ecovation Hub itself. And we see that um, we see membership-based dues revenues into the organization. We see recurring royalty revenues as businesses are spun off. Uh, for instance, if the hub has a relationship with EcoFire, there could be special classes of shares that deliver dividends back into the hub itself. So the hub ultimately can become sustainable. Uh, there can be project-specific revenues. Um, I'm not sure what chub earned revenues are on the right. I think that's a misspelling. I created this slide. I have no idea. <laughs> I have no idea. Um, but we, hub, or that's it. Hub earned revenues. Okay, for launching unique conferences uh, and summits and things of that nature, a partnership with the with the Knowledge Center and others. Uh, we believe this region through the hub will become a national and international center of activity. Uh, and then we have public and foundation revenues. We've actually created a, a four-year plan that shows where those revenue streams come in. We've also showed how you might use those funds uh, in that. So there actually is a plan, believe it or not. Okay, and we are uh, already beginning, we, at EcoFire, we just spent almost all day today meeting with uh, potential funders and, uh, and, and literally putting fund development plans together for, for the major operation of this. So um, we are intending, as we move out from tonight, we're moving forward on implementation. And we're not doing that without thinking about the money it's going to take to make this happen. Uh, so uh, and we have, I think this is the final slide, Candace. Uh, this slide basically shows you that here you have, in a different form, all the action teams working. And then you have all these, these different here at EcoFire, Resilient Design Advisor Tool, which is a whole database uh, company and system that uh, Green River is going to be working on, and, and uh, RDI and uh, Green Building. Uh, you have EcoFire over here. You have the Education Training Consortium. So we already have three potential implementation partners already, and there'll be more of those that spin out. So the idea here is not just a plan, but to implement an act and actually have implementation partners that have signed up to make businesses out of them to make them sustainable. It is exactly one time. I'm finished. <laughs> I hope that explains what we're doing. Okay, so where do we start? You know, we've just this meeting represents the culmination of a, what, an eight or nine month process? The 13 months. 13 months. Uh, but who's counting? Uh, you know, the four milestone meetings. But really, you know, we're just starting. You know, we've put the pieces in place. We now need to do the hard work to actually realize success with all these different ideas. So we've got a timeline that uh, we've been working on. You know, we are here and we hope to get right off, right to, to work, raising some initial funding. We want to do that to be able to hire a part-time director, somebody who can, you know, keep the activities going, keep the uh, fundraising efforts afloat, keep uh, these 
action teams working, keeping the, the different implementation partners uh, moving full steam ahead. So we're hoping to raise some money for that and for general support. Uh, Frank mentioned that we plan to have, have a fiduciary partner that will probably be Brodeberg Development Credit Corporation that will sort of provide back-end services to um, you know, manage grants that we get to you know, file necessary paperwork to you know, help out with all of that stuff. Uh, we're trying to figure out the exact structure to you know, be able to hire somebody part-time. Ultimately, we'd like it to be a full-time person, but we want to start with something where, that we think we can afford. Um, we will be identifying and recruiting a new leadership team. We've had a leadership team that's worked for the past year to get us where we are. Uh, that leadership team, and we, had, we twisted arms to get people to participate in that group, and we've you know, had an amazing team, and a really great cross-section of the region and the, the businesses in the area. You know, some of those people will be continuing on, but we uh, aren't expecting universal continuation on that leadership team. So part of the purpose of this meeting is to say, look, this is out here. Let us know if you'd like to get involved in a more direct way. So we'll be looking to recruit more people onto the leadership team. And you saw the structure of that leadership team membership, you know, where the different participants will be coming from. Uh, we'll be, as we develop an organization, the Ecovation Hub, we'll be developing bylaws and sort of all of that stuff and doing paperwork with the state, setting up a, a nonprofit corporation. We'll be establishing a detailed work plan for 2017 and beyond. And then we'll begin longer term fundraising. And the leadership team will be taking the lead with fundraising, uh, really trying to, to work with donors, to work with foundations, to work with businesses. We're talking about a membership model, an affordable membership model for businesses in the area to participate in, in funding this, particularly with seed funding. And then we're also looking to the EcoFire group for involvement in this. You know, ultimately, we hope that the, you know, if the EcoFire can achieve its you know, exciting vision, and it really is exciting, if that can succeed even you know, half what uh, Dan Yates and Kevin Warner are envisioning, you know, people will be thinking about this part of the country as a real leader in, uh, in finance, in insurance, in uh, these different parts that together comprise FIRE, finance, insurance, real estate. Uh, so that's, uh, you know, we've got an aggressive uh, schedule ahead of us, but uh, we're very excited about it. Uh, so the short-term transition, you know, the, the work that we're going to be getting uh, right now, uh, the, there are a couple of initiatives that have grown out of this that are really moving into the implementation phase. Um, Kevin talked about the EcoFire group. Uh, Abigail uh, Walton at uh, Antioch is leading the uh, Education and Training Consortium, very exciting initiatives. And you know, it's been really neat to see as we've brainstormed about these ideas, the discussions that have happened across different institutions. World Learning, or SIT here, is now you know, working with Antioch and developing some joint programs. It's, it's really cool to see that going on. And that will be continuing. Abby is putting together a, a pretty involved and exciting initiative with a bunch of area institutions of higher learning to uh, really work together in realizing some of these ideas. I mentioned recruiting the leadership team. Uh, again, let us know, let me know on your little brochures that you picked up when you came in. There's contact information for a lot of us here on the, the key uh, organization. Let us know if you have ideas. If you'd like to participate either on the leadership team or on one of the action teams, we'd love to get more people involved. Um, we're working on short-term funding plans. 
And again, this will be a, a variety of funding sources. And we'd love to hear ideas. You know, we have a lot of discussions that are happening. Um, there are some people very excited about the vision we've pointed out uh, for the region. But uh, you know, we need other contacts as well. So let us know if you've got thoughts. Maybe it's a family foundation. Maybe it's uh, impact investing. Maybe it's um, corporations that want to support the region and see it continuing to grow economically. Let us know your ideas, and we will be following those up. Um, to help with that, the leadership team will be establishing a fundraising team that will, you know, a smaller committee that will spearhead a lot of that work. Uh, and then we're also putting together a team that will sort of follow up the work that the govern governance committee did of the Ecovation Hub to really refine some of the formalities in working ahead with this, uh, with the businesses, business entities growing out of this. Uh, we talked about the sort of support, this uh, fiduciary role for the back office support and uh, receiving funds. Uh, we'll be working with a partner, a nonprofit partner that can accept foundation support, a 501c3 organization. It will probably be the Resilient Design Institute, which is based in Brattleboro and has a 501c3 status, so can accept funds on behalf of the Ecovation Hub. Um, we'll be formalizing relationships with, uh, with the various implementation partners, you know, both the ones that are ready to go today and others as they grow to that level of maturity. We'll be formalizing relationships with local liaisons. This is what Frank talked about coming out of the regions, uh, the Monadnock region, the upper Pioneer Valley region in Massachusetts and southern Vermont. Um, and then finally, we'll be providing support for the uh, continued function of the project teams. You know, these are the teams for individual projects that are uh, emerging out of this Ecovation Hub. Okay, so what we'd like from you and, and others that you're talking with about this initiative, suggestions of people who can get involved in the committees we have, the leadership team, the fundraising committee, uh, the governance committee, other efforts, the, the action teams, these uh, implementation partners that we're, we're working with. So let us know if you'd like to get involved. We'd love to see more people joining these uh, working groups and action teams. Uh, again, fundraising, we really need ideas. Uh, we've got a lot already, but uh, you know, the more the merrier. You know, we have some aggressive goals, raising $100,000 in the next month or two uh, to get some initial funding underway so that we can have some part-time staffing in place and then longer-term funding at a higher level. Uh, and then we're also, as, as, we, as Frank mentioned, working on a membership structure. Uh, we're looking at you know, different pricing ideas for that. We want it to be a membership structure for businesses and institutions that's affordable. We'd like to get broad participation. And you know, certainly the companies that are in this sort of eco-economy field, the green economy, but also all businesses in the region, businesses that want to see you know, this area prosper economically. And you know, that brings us back to you know, how this got started with the, um, you know, a huge motivator was the closure of Vermont Yankee and the recognition that the region was going to be losing 600 jobs, uh, well-paying jobs, and we wanted to replace those jobs in a way that, you know, not only brought economic well-being to the region, but also helped the environment, you know, <coughs> helped address some of the huge environmental problems we're going to be facing over the coming decades. So we're looking at a membership structure that would, you know, provide a, you know, a, a sliding scale depending on the size of the company. We'd love input on that as we refine that on the leadership team. So if you have thoughts, maybe you've had experience with 
that sort of membership organization, we'd love to hear those thoughts. <coughs> might be just about out of battery power on this little projector. Uh, so I wanted to invite uh, Michael Knapp up. Michael has been a part of the leadership team. Uh, he has a 30-person company in Brattleboro uh, Green River, uh, started in Guilford uh, on the Green River. But uh, Michael is someone that our company, Building Green, has worked with for years in developing some uh, you know, really advanced uh, internet-based resources and software tools, and Michael's been a, a key part of helping us envision what, what's possible here. So he's going to provide some kind of concluding remarks on behalf of the leadership team. Thanks, Alex. <clears throat> so, um, on behalf of the hubs, leadership team, the outgoing leadership team. So I was asked, as Alex just said, to talk about the challenges and the opportunities that are coming up in the next year and the years ahead. Um, and before I do that, I guess I want to start by reflecting uh, on the, as Frank pointed out, the 13 months that we've just been through uh, for a second. Um, and I want to speak for myself, but I'd like a lot of us in the room, when I say we, we joined on to what Vital Economy was doing, what Building Green, um, and Alex, uh, we're doing, um, and others in our community with both a mix of excitement and I think a healthy dose of skepticism. Um, and uh, you know why the excitement? Well, the excitement was about the fact that development, economic development in our region was collaboration. It was about collaborating with one another, um, and this initiative meant that to us. Um, excitement about the mission. Um, as Frank told us, a mission to become, quote, a recognized national leader in creating resilient, sustainable buildings and communities, and that those projects belong here in this region was something we all felt pretty excited about. I think excited that instead of mourning about the loss of 600 jobs when Vermont Yankee closed, we were envisioning 60 new businesses, 6,000 jobs opening, in an economy that we were going to collaborate to create. And lastly, I think an excitement about developing an economic initiative about things that we really care about, about um, responding to climate change, about building uh, resilient communities. That meant a lot to all of us. And, and I think um, when um, Marianne Christensen at uh, Hannah Graham Center um, asked me to speak about the hub uh, at an a entrepreneurship event that she hosted um, about a month ago. I, I talked about it as an opportunity to extend this sort of special sauce, this something that's different about our region to other, that, that we, we were seeing something emerge in sustainable agriculture, in tourism, uh, in the hospitality industry, um, something that you know, is even beginning to emerge out of our politics. I think we, we saw Howard Dean hit the national stage a decade ago, or Bernie Sanders just last year, that, that there's something going on in this community and this region um, that we could grab onto and use to develop as an economic strategy beyond the traditional sectors where it's been working. Um, and so that all made a lot of sense, but we were skeptical. Um, we're skeptical because, you know, could this actually work? Could it take hold? Is it going to come to fruition? Um, could it be viable over the long term? Would it actually materialize into concrete work for our businesses, for our schools, and for our neighbors? Um, and you know, we're seeing these amazing, ambitious numbers from Vital Economy and others that blow us away. But but it, you know, were those milestones actually achievable? Um, and so. That's how it starts, and sort of looking back on this first year, a lot's gone well, and I think more than that, it definitely has exceeded our expectations thus far. So first of all, I mean, we're not only all still here, 
but the initiative's growing in size and scope. So we added regenerative ag and forestry, for example, and that's a group that's come to the table with that huge host of great projects you saw. Um, yeah, almost kind of grew out of nowhere into this initiative. It grew from BDCC and, and Wyndham County outward to now southern Vermont and then on the, the Monadnock region, the Pioneer Valley, um, and folks in Greenfield and Keene have really come to the table with robust and meaningful participation already. Um, the colleges and the universities in the area who are meeting to form a knowledge center that has amazing momentum, uh, it seems very real. Um, the Eco Fire Group um, that you've heard about, the job they've done envisioning innovative financial instruments. Um, I'm on a metrics and benchmarking committee that's pulling together tech businesses to begin to think about the platform for this initiative and how to use software to hold us accountable and pull us together. Um, and perhaps most importantly, I think what you saw earlier was coming out of year one, a governance structure that was very specific and really mature. Um, and so that, that, that's an amazing accomplishment, I think, for this first year. Um, obviously, a lot lies ahead. Um, it is a very challenging initiative. It's a huge transformation. Um, we're here remaining optimistic, we're remaining skeptical, I think, you know, and um, what I'm most optimistic about, personally, um, this new economy, because as entrepreneurs developing new initiatives, um, I think we're the ones to know that money and jobs no longer have to come with the cost of pollution, that we're going to transform business as usual into in a new economy centered in this region that proves that economic development is environmental protection and environmental protection is economic development. Um, so we're concluding 2016 with a strong commitment from your outgoing leadership team. The, the about 14 people on that team um, are all, I think, really committed to seeing the initiative continue um, and working to realize that organizational structure you heard about. But the thing is, and I'm not, I'm not, I hope this doesn't sound trite, but this doesn't, it's not an initiative that works for you. It really works because of you. So I'm kind of asking that you stick with us, that you continue to work with your neighbors, and that we together begin to envision green buildings, healthy workforces, and resilient communities as our economic development strategy. Thanks. Thank you, Michael, and thank you all for coming. I just want to take a quick moment to thank Vital Economy, BDCC, everyone who's worked on this initiative thus far, the action team leaders. Thank you all for believing in these regions, believing in what we do here, and giving us the space to come together and do all this, because it's just so remarkable. I hope you all were as inspired as I was. And like Michael said, you stick around, because I think there's a lot more to come not only an initiative, but also here. We have our food and some wine. So I hope you stay and mingle and ask questions um, and continue to stick with us. Thanks.